Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's wildfire update. I'm Heather Fairbairn, and I'll be your moderator. Once again, we have a cast of familiar faces who will provide an update on the response, and we thank them for making the time to speak with us today. So with that, let's dive right in and allow me to introduce the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, the Honourable Tory Rushton. Go ahead, Minister. Thank you, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. Our province has seen almost two weeks of major wildfires now. It's been a long haul for a whole lot of people. For those who have been evacuated, for everyone fighting the fires, for everyone coordinating a wide variety of supports, I want to thank each and every one of you for your contributions and your thoughts through this difficult time. I'm cautiously optimistic with the news that came in last night. Our aerial view of the Barrington Lake fire shows that is being held. That means our firefighting tactics are working with some assistance from the weather. And if conditions stay the same, we don't expect this fire to spread. But I want to be clear, it is still not under control. We're working hard to get this under control and put it out. We ask for your patience with this as we continue our hard work. I understand that the area municipalities are starting to share information with property owners. And those conversations continue for people in Tantallon area as well. For some, I know this is devastating news. My heart is going out to each and every one of you that are facing losses of your homes. For others, the news is a little better, but there are still lots of hurdles to overcome. Please know that we are here to support and help you through this. There are supports in place and more to come. As of today, people displaced by wildfires can call 211 for information on short and long-term accommodations available in their areas. For those who are allowed to return home and in the days to come, please follow instructions from your local municipalities. If you have a well, follow instructions for safe drinking water on the alert page. I can confirm that test kits are being restocked at various locations listed on our webpage, and more locations will be added shortly. But please only pick up a kit if you need it and are ready to use it now. Again, I want to thank each and every one of you for your patience, your cooperation, and your perseverance. Above all, I want to thank you for doing whatever you can to help your fellow Nova Scotians through all the challenging times that we were facing because of these wildfires. Thank you. Thank you for that, Minister. And now allow me to welcome back Warden Eddie Nickerson for the Mis Municipality of the District of Barrington. Go ahead, Warden. Uh, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Minister Rushton. It is with great relief and gratitude that we announced the successful containment and holding of the wildfires across Southwest Nova Scotia, including the devastating Barrington Lake wildfire, which is the largest wildfire in Nova Scotian history. We have now seen multiple days of no significant growth of this wildfire. We extend our ha heartfelt thanks to many people who came together to keep our community safe during these stressful times. As we enter the phase of recovery and re-entry, we ask that community members and residents be patient and remember that your municipalities have your back. Safety and your best interest will be priority number one. Wildfires can damage wells and impact drinking water. The province will be covering the cost of well water testing kits for those who were evacuated. The pickup locations are currently at Yarmouth and, Bar Yarmouth and Bar Bridgewater Environmental and Climate Change Regional Offices. However, we are working towards securing local pickup locations for both municipalities. While the operation remains ongoing, I'm happy to report that the fire at the construction and demolition disposal site has been completely extinguished in part, large, in large part, thanks to the crews who worked around the clock. For further updates related to highway, re, further updates related to the highway reopening will be provided once available. Please call 511 for the latest information on road closures. Thank you again for your continued strength and patience. Thank you, Warden Nickerson. Now I'd like to call upon Warden Penny Smith 
from the Municipality of the District of Shelburne. Go ahead, Warden. Thank you, Minister Rushton and Warden Nickerson. We again must thank our communities for their strength and patience as we continue on through this unprecedented wildfire event. We understand that this is an extremely stressful time and we are working hard to ensure that all community members and residents are properly informed during the next phase. We are expediting the process for re-entry and focused on taking a safety first approach. Fire marshals and RCMP are completing inspections and conducting investigations. The re-entry timing will depend on the completion of this work. Yesterday evening, we announced that starting today, Wednesday, June 7th, those who remain evacuated from their homes and properties in Shelburne County are asked to contact their municipality to book an appointment where they will be given an information package and learn more about the status of their property. Please remember that booking an appointment does not mean your house has been damaged or destroyed. You will be provided with information regarding the status of your property, water testing kits, garbage disposal information, and other necessary information relevant to safely entering your property when evacuation orders are lifted. Please refer to the municipality's EMO Facebook pages for the phone numbers to book your appointment at. We are currently experiencing high volumes call volumes and it may take several attempts to speak with a municipal representative. Please know we understand this can be frustrating and again we ask for your patience. For the consideration of those whose properties have been damaged or destroyed, it is paramount that we speak with property owners on one to one rather than th through mass distribution of notification. And please remember that we are all in this together. Thank you for that, Warden Smith. Now we'll check in with Dave Rockwood, Public Information Officer, for an update on the activities on the ground in Shelburne and Barrington. Go ahead, Dave. Dave, you're on mute. Thanks. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we're sitting uh, through some more precise aerial measurements and uh, tight line measurements on the ground. Uh, we've been able to narrow down the, uh, the area of this fire. So we're actually dropping the size down to 23411. Uh, so that's a difference of about 1,569 hectares. So uh, we're, we're co it still covers about 234 square kilometers. Uh, as Mr. Minister Rushton had mentioned, uh, the fire is being held, which uh, with the uh, present weather conditions and the present attack tactics and our resources, um, we're able to, uh, to hold it at the size it's at. Um, we will monitor it and we will continue to uh, work the ground uh, daily until we're comfortable. We can uh, uh, ensure that every little bit of uh, uh, smoldering uh, debris is out and that this wildfire is not going to cause trouble. Uh, we have 130 uh, wild, wild, wildfire personnel on site today. Um, those are from uh, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, uh, and the Northeast Compact, as well as PEI. Um, we do have three of our helicopters in the area, uh, two from Natural Resources and one a private contractor. And the 802 air tankers out of New Brunswick are available, but we do, don't expect to need them. Uh, there's probably around 40, and, oh, sorry, approximately 40 volunteer firefighters in the area as well, assisting with uh, uh, operations. And uh, yeah, that's uh, we're 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 moving forward and may, we're making ground. Good news, Dave. Thanks for that. And finally, we'll wrap things up with Erica Fleck, Director of Emergency Management with the Halifax Regional Municipality. Go ahead. Thanks, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just want to say that we know residents are looking for more information on the residents that are still evacuated, and we're committed to providing this. We're working to improve all of our communications and the way that the information has been presented on our website at halifax.ca to make it easier for residents to find what's most important to them. And we'll continue to update that daily. In addition to our daily PSAs and social media efforts, we'll be providing regular municipal media briefings about the recovery efforts, and we'll have more information on that tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Erica. So we'll go into
to the quick Q&A portion now with media. Before we do, I'll just uh, let folks know that we have uh, Scott Tingley, Manager of Forest Protection with the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables, also joining us to help out with the Q&A portion, along with Bill Lawler, Atlantic Director of Government and Strategic Relations with the Canadian Red Cross, and as well, Elizabeth Kennedy, Director of the Water Branch with Nova Scotia's Department of Environment and Climate Change. And so with that, we'll uh, go to questions um, from the media participating. And again, we'll stick with that one question, one follow-up format. If you could indicate who your question's for, again, that would be helpful. And we'll start things off with CTV's Lindsay Armstrong. Go ahead, Lindsay. Uh, thank you. First off, um, we're hearing from residents in both the Shelburne and Tantallon areas who have confirmation that their homes not been damaged by fire and that power has been restored to their area, but they have still not been permitted to return home. Sorry, Can you help these residents understand uh, why that is? Yeah, so it's Erica Fleck here from HRM, so I'll start here. Um, so the area of significant impact in the talent in the tenant talent area, although their home may not have been damaged, um, our our assessment is not complete, and there are a number of risks that we are very worried about. Contamination being the biggest one, we have uh, oil furnaces spilled, uh, we have propane tanks blowing up, as recent as yesterday. Obviously, streets, you know, maybe not cleared. There are still down power lines on some of the streets. Again, uh, well caps off. We have uh, sunken um, sewer um, spewing. We have um, a whole list of hazards that are still ongoing that do not make it safe um, for people to traverse through those neighborhoods. So we're working with um, our provincial partners and other resources to try and get that obviously mitigated as soon as possible. Well, that paints a picture. Um any of the other uh, municipal partners wanted to respond to that question or shall I move on? I can say Yeah, thank you very much. Um, very similar for us. It's a matter of investigations and, and inspections needing to be completed. Great, thank you for that, Warden. Uh, Lindsay, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you for that. Um, I believe this question will be directed to Minister Rushton, although I may be wrong. I understand volunteer firefighters have been an important part of this uh, work alongside DNRR and municipal firefighting crews. Can you help us understand how these volunteer firefighters will be compensated for this work? Yeah, cer certainly. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, so e even before the wildfires this season, uh, the, the volunteer sector, the Fire Service Association of Scotia, and, and the province always had an agreement on, on reimbursements uh, uh, for response to, to wildfires, for equipment use, for, for personnel hours and, and such. Uh, th this fire was uh, extremely different than anything we've ever seen in the province of Scotia in recent history. So what we uh, also did this, this time, we did a call out through, uh, through the Fire Service Association of Scotia. We did a call out for uh, volunteers that would like to volunteer and, and be added to a list that uh, would meet the training standard of a wild firefighter because there is a difference between structural firefighter and wild firefighting. Um, huge difference. We wanted to uh, incorporate a list that uh, we, we could actually keep in the department uh, uh, for, for this, this uh, situation. Um, I think we had over 300 uh, volunteer firefighters uh, call in and register. And I wanna say a heartfelt thank you to each and every one of those volunteers that stood up to offer their assistance. Um, and as we go through that list, uh, if they meet the wildfire training standard, the fit testing that uh, has to be completed, there, there is a process that they can be hired as a temporary worker uh, uh, for this. Uh, so, so this is a list that we're going to uh, engage all, all this, uh, all this, the rest of this fire season, if you will, and look at how we can work with Fire Service Association of Scotia to maybe enhance our, our, uh, our, uh, our, our, our members that are available through, uh, through the next fire season and, and develop an even stronger relationship with the fire service. Uh, right now, I can't say as how many of those have uh, been called in to be on the front lines, but look, I know that the local, uh, uh, local fire services that have been assisting down in Shelburne, the, the assisting uh, in around HRM, have called in neighboring uh, uh, volunteer fire departments. So when I was in Sh Shelburne yesterday, I saw uh, uh, many of uh, Valley Fire Department that were there assisting with the CND uh, uh, fire. So there's been a huge outpouring of support from, from volunteer sectors all over the pr process. Even if it wasn't a DNR process, uh, we had an unfortunate si uh, circumstances with these large wildfires, but we now have a place in, in pro progress uh, 
that I, I both certainly believe that we can have a stronger relationship with volunteers and also see a, a, an equivalent uh, reimbursement for those volunteers that are going to put their time out in dedication to our province. Thank you for that. We'll move along now to CBC's Blair Rhodes. Go ahead, Blair. Yeah, my question is for uh, Warden Nickerson. It's about the uh, the demo site fire. I realize it's out, but uh, do we have any idea at this point how it started and what actually burned there? Uh, yeah, the it it started from the uh, Barrington Lake Lake fire, um, just encroaching on the on the uh, landfill. Um, what burned would have been. Um, uh, construction and demolition debris that would be put in that, that would be deposited there. There would have been some brush there. Um, we do have a metal um, holding facility or like to hold metals, old washers, dryers, uh, refrigerators that we uh, have crushed and taken away that would have uh, burnt. Um, we do have uh, uh, some uh, lobster pots that get crushed and taken away. Those would have uh, some of that would have uh, been caught in the fire. But uh, mostly just uh, uh, construction and uh, demolition debris. Go ahead with your follow-up, Blair. Yeah, I realize Bob Robichaud isn't on this call today, but I was just wondering, we're seeing um, air quality alerts for, from as far away as New York, Toronto, Ottawa. Is, uh, are Nova Scotia wildfires contributing to it? And if so, what is the, what are the air conditions like around here? Who's best positioned to take that one? I'll, I'll take that one, Heather. So yeah, down this way right now, we have uh, limited to no smoke being produced from the Barrington Lake wildfire, other than what would have been over the last 24 hours coming out of the uh, the uh, C&D site. So uh, uh, I'd say last week we were definitely contributing, but this week uh, we're definitely happy to say that uh, we're not. Uh, I could add a little context to the the national situation. So there are large wildfires in Quebec, Ontario, uh, through the prairies and, and uh, through the western provinces and up in the Northwest Territory. So it's a very, very busy stretch for Canada, and that's likely contributing to, to most of that smoke. Thanks for that, Scott. I'll move along now to Radio Canada. Adrian Blanc, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister Rushton, uh, what help is exactly provided to Quebec from Nova Scotia? So that might be a, a better question for Scott that would coordinate the meet, regular daily meetings with CIFC. Uh, uh, Scott would be uh, better able to uh, answer that, I think. Scott, uh, would you be able to jump in there? Sure. And sorry, Adrian, can you just repeat the question? Yes, I was wondering what help is exactly provided to Quebec from Nova Scotia. Uh, so we've uh, released... Uh, we. During last week, we contracted, as a lot of people know, uh, some 415-air water bombers from Montana. Uh, so we did a direct uh, contract with the company. So they're still on contract with Nova Scotia, and and as Nova Sco or, uh, Quebec asked for help uh, through the weekend, uh, we've released those aircraft to to head up to Quebec and give them a hand. So uh, we had also released the uh, the Newfoundland bombers back to Newfoundland. My understanding is that. Those aircraft are going to go up and, and get some maintenance and desalination. And then I believe they were also being offered up, but just kind of indirectly from Nova Scotia. So all aircraft. Thanks for that. Go ahead with your follow-up, Adrian. My question is for Minister Rushton. Um, I talked to several local businesses today in Sherbourne, and they have told me that $2,500 is not much, and it's only limited to local businesses that are in the evacuation area. Uh, they would like the province to step up for all the businesses that have been impacted but are not in the evacuation area. What are you responding to them? Yeah, th thank you for that, Adrian. I, I certainly uh, I certainly sympathize that there, there's been a lot of people and, and a lot of businesses put out of place in Nova Scotia over the last uh, week and a half. And uh, it's, uh, it's certainly a hardship for, for many, many people involved. We, we, we have announced that there's uh, there's relief programs for, for residents. There's relief uh, for small businesses. And look, what, what, what I would say is uh, look, we're, we're evaluating every step of the day. Uh, we've been concentrating on fighting the fires uh, first and foremost. And as we transition to a different, uh, a different role into those fighting those fires and uh, assisting people back to uh, some sort of normalcy in each area, we'll certainly carry on conversations. 
Great. Next, let's go with to uh, Joe Thompson with Acadia Broadcasting. Go ahead, Joe. Um, my question is for Minister Rushton. Uh, you mentioned earlier that people who were displaced by the fires can now call 211 to seek some uh, accommodations while they can't get into their homes or while their homes have been destroyed. What uh, options are available for those people um, when they call? So uh, just for a quick example, I know that there, uh, there's there been some uh, some hospitality uh, hotels that have uh, stepped up to say, look, there, there's just some rooms here. Um, but I, my understanding too is that uh, by calling 211, um, we're, we're certainly going to try and uh, uh, assist each each family that calls in with different needs uh, and, and uh, do, a, do a step process with each uh, individual families. Uh, there, there may be uh, individuals with just uh, two seniors that are in a home that might need something totally different that has a has a five family, uh, three pet uh, uh, need, needs as they call in. So it's gonna be an individual basis. Uh, but look, we, we wanted to set something up to ensure that uh, that people had, had an outreach point where if, if they were uh, they, they were in the need, we wanted to certainly have that step for, for outreach so we can understand their needs. And, uh, and get them into the proper process. Go ahead with your follow-up, Joe. And my follow-up is for uh, Warden Nickerson. Um, with the CND fire now being put out, can we assume that that'll expedite the process to reopen Highway 103? And can that be opened um, relatively soon, as early as tomorrow, possibly? Um, I'm not sure when when the province will uh, open the the uh, 103, I, I would uh, think that that would be uh, a public works decision. Uh, but with the fire put out, it does uh, alleviate that concern of, of the safety passing by that area with, with vehicles, um, with the fire trucks that were on the side of the road and, and, and uh, fire hoses running up the road. So it, it certainly will help in the process, but um, uh, we'll leave that to, to the uh, others, other powers to be to make that decision. Thank you for that, uh, Warden. Let's move along to Tim Bousquet with the examiner. Go ahead, Tim. Hi, good afternoon. I just want to follow up on Lindsay Armstrong's question about be people being let into the, uh, or not, not being let back into the fire zone, even though their um, houses are still standing. Uh, as I understood her question, she said that people were um, uh, their their power was being turned on. And as I recall, yesterday's municipal release said that in the other evacuation areas, people were being let back into their house three or four hours before the power was let on so that they could unplug things and, and make sure that their house was safe from additional fire. So is there a coordination problem between Nova Scotia power and people coming back into evacuation zones? Erica, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Heather. Um, so I would say, no, there's not a coordination problem, but I do know there are often overlaps, for example, where the power um, hubs are when we turn on certain neighborhoods that they are linked, you know, to across the street, for example. Um, so one of the examples in the Tantallon areas, we did open up, you know, part of Hammonds Plains Road, but that is linked to other areas. So there will be some spots with some small pockets of power that are on um, where people are not home yet. Tim, do you have a follow up? Just very quickly. I mean that that answers it. But have there been have there been any um, house fires started from electricity since the evacuation? Uh, no, there have not. So anytime we've per turned on uh, turned back on the power with residents that have been evacuated, we make sure that there are fire apparatus close by when the power does come back on, just in case. Obviously, cognizant of the fact that people left very quickly and may have left appliances on and things like that, which is why it's coordinated very closely with with uh, Nova Scotia Power. Thank you. That's awesome, thank you. Let's move along to CTV's Heidi Petrachik. Go ahead, Heidi. Thanks. Um, I just want to circle back to communications with Erica Fleck. And, you know, a lot of residents uh, who are still evacuated from the uh, Tantallon areas of concern say communications up until this point have been poor, in their opinion. A uh, few of them have received a call from the municipality. Some of them were notified their properties were impacted by mass email. Um, they can't get answers from people when they call 311. Um, how do you address their concerns? I know you said you're improving communications, but how do you answer to them uh, so far to this point? Yeah, um, so thanks, Heidi. So a couple of things. We've had community meetings, uh, a few of them, and we have another one uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, we've also, we have a, a 
plus mailbox, as you'll call it, HRM EMO mailbox, where residents, uh, we have hundreds and hundreds every day to ask questions directly, which we have a full-time person dedicated to answering all those questions. Um, you know, we're trying to get out the, the messaging as quick as we can. Um, sometimes it's, uh, to be honest, it's never going to be good enough. And I would, I'm sure I'd feel the same way if I was in their shoes. Um, but there is open correspondence with everyone who wants it um, through again through 311 if they don't know the answer they pass it along to us um, and we do answer everything go ahead with your follow-up Heidi thank you for that um, the other question uh, I guess I would ask is you know some residents feel like the media were allowed on a on a media tour um, of affected areas and they could get off and film they're just wondering could they be afforded the same um, opportunity uh, you know maybe not permanently go back, but at least to go back and, and walk their properties for insurance purposes or other purposes. Um, you know, these are people who weren't on the bus because they still have homes that were standing. Um, so I'm wondering if anything like that could be facilitated. Some people would like that, they say. Um, again, as soon as we deem the area safe to go into for people to to get out and walk around, then the residents are our first concern. There was obviously a big push from the media, and it continues to be a balancing act that they want to report, um, you know, generally about the state of the area. So it was very controlled. Um, they weren't allowed to wander. We had RCMP escorts, fire escorts in a very controlled environment with a very few people, one vehicle. And we'll wrap things up today with DTV's Sarah Plowman. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks very much. Um, I understand that there are high volumes of calls um, for people here in the Shelburne County area wanting information about their homes. Um, I've, I've witnessed someone unable to get through at all. Uh, the, the telephone you know, number just simply stops. Um, so is that an issue that you're seeing across the board? Are calls just unavailable if they're busy? Uh, and if so, what's being done to improve that situation? So, so go ahead, Penny. Sorry, I can try to, um, to take this question. Um, I know that our staff and the recovery team are uh, dealing with or ha handling this next phase. So um, I'm hoping that all of the calls that have been placed are being answered at this time. We do know that there was a, a large volume of calls at the beginning. Um, and we just ask for the residents' patience as we go through this. Warden Nickerson, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just, um, yeah, it, 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 the phone lines are busy and, and our staff are doing their utmost to keep up with this. And I would just encourage residents to keep calling. It is, it's essential that uh, we get them back in their homes. Um, it's, um, I, 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 I just feel uh, that it's important that, uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, been calls and, and uh, I would wanna get back to my home too. So we are doing, I can assure you, we are doing our best and our staff is uh, working nonstop. Um, I, I would like to say 24 seven, but it isn't 24 seven, but it's it's a very long hours and um, we'll continue to do so. And uh, hopefully we see some uh, fairly quick movement on that in the, in the very, very near future. Thank you, Warden. Sarah, go ahead with your follow-up. Thank you. Uh, people who live in the area also seem to believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's necessary to actually have an appointment with someone before you can go home. And as you know, the wait to get an appointment starts with a wait to be on the phone and then an appointment. And then so this just they feel this is delaying their return home even further. So they're wondering why they need to make an appointment before anyone goes home and why they have to have that appointment. So, Smith? Yeah, so I, I think the, the main reason for that is that we want to have that conversation with our residents one-on-one -on -one, and we want to make sure that they have all of the information that they need as they transition from, uh, you know, from, from the fire into where, where the next phase is going to take them. We, we don't want them to just go home without the information that they need. Warden Nickerson, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I, I think it's uh, 
it's a safety. Uh, I think Eliz uh, Erica alluded to some of it previously too. Uh, there's there's safety issues here, so uh, we want to make sure that that there's no down lines and and um, just we're trying to look after the residents as as best as possible. So um, again, certainly keep calling, be patient, and um, it's it's uh, it's coming along, and uh, it's been a long hard battle, but um, we feel and and we're there with you. Thanks for that, Warden. Well, that concludes today's um, wildfire update, and I want to thank everyone for joining us once again today. Thank you.